Welcome to Med Evidence, where we help you navigate the truth behind medical research with unbiased, evidence proven facts. Powered by Encore Research Group and hosted by cardiologist and top medical researcher, Dr. Michael Corrin. Hello, I'm Dr. Michael Corrin, hosting our fourth and final session speaking about advanced lipid profiles for med evidence with my dear friend and colleague, Dr. Al Lopez. And we've had some great conversations about how to use advanced lipid profile testing. And I wanted to uh, wrap up our discussion by you're talking about some very famous people who died early, and also talk about how we use this over the course of time. So before we get into that, though, there's a little trivia question that we like to ask people, and I think it's be useful for the audience to hear the answer to that. And the trivia question is basically, what's the most common symptom or presentation of heart disease? Is it arm pain? Is it chest pain? Is it short of shortness of breath? Or is it sudden death? Sudden death. Oh, that was quick. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, that is true. So the most common presentation would be dying without a warning, Yep. which is a little bit scary, which also points out how important it is to be prepared, to know about your family history, to look at things before it's too late. Now, of course, there is a little caveat in that question between men and women. I don't know if you want to comment on that. I think the data is much more voracious on men dying of sudden death than women. But women that have heart disease and tend to progress, even when treated, progress along with cardiovascular disease and heart failure and, yeah, so, uh, and don't do as well. Yeah, men, d- men will typically die at a younger suddenly. age of heart disease. Yeah. They're much more likely to die suddenly of heart disease than women. And they're more likely, if they get past um, that stage of sudden death, they're more yeah. likely to have typical symptoms than women. So those are the things that we know about the difference between men and women. All right, so let's let's talk about uh, some you know very famous people. We 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 started this conversation by talking about our ties, our, our Jerry Garcia ties, and we talked about the fact that Jerry Garcia died of a heart attack at age fifty three. Um, he was involved in drug rehab and and didn't live the healthiest lifestyle, and had gained a bunch of weight. His risk factors were not under control when he died, and we had both decided that yes, we would have gotten an advanced lipid profile on Jerry Garcia before he was fifty three. And that could have saved his life. Could have. And we also uh, we also talked about the fact that there are other people like Keith Richards who live the same lifestyle as Jerry Garcia, but somehow make it into their 80s. But again, you don't know what their genetics are unless you check that advanced lipid profile. But let's talk about some other people. Uh, Arthur Ashe, I think he died at age 38. Right. I think he had bypass surgery. I, I actually met Arthur Ashe at New York Hospital. And he had bypass surgery in his 30s. And, you know, what, what was his deal? Would you have gotten an advanced lipid profile for him? You know, Willie didn't have that at that time. But if it was today, and if he had a family history, yeah, I think an advanced lipid profile and looking at an LP little a would have been pivotal in treating him and mm. seeing what his hidden risk was be, beyond a standard lipid yeah. profile. Thin guy. But thin guy, muscular. Guy. Yeah, yeah. Very- very, so Never been overweight. No, Incredible no, tennis player, yeah, right? No, and no lifestyle issues. He no. was he was a Boy Scout, from what everybody yeah. uh, everybody's told me. And um, uh, unfortunately, needed bypass surgery done at New York Hospital. And unfortunately, he developed HIV disease during that hospitalization and ultimately died of AIDS. Yeah, and that was a blood transfusion. It, right? was, it was yeah. not. It was not any other risk factor that Correct. he was an unfortunate recipient of bad blood. Yeah. And, and there are many other people. Okay, uh, now, let's see. We, we talked about Jerry Garcia. How about Jim Morrison? He, uh, he famously died in a bathtub in Paris at age 27 or 28. Right. Um, and I think he, quote, died of heart failure. Did he need an advanced lipid profile? Well, or- there's a big question on why he died of heart failure. Right? So he was uh, using heroin at the time. We know that mm. causes... Yeah, you know, I, would, I would be renal less inclined issues, to get, yeah. get an advanced I wouldn't lipid do it profile right. in Jim Morrison. Yeah. I think, um, and I think I'm not sure. dad was old didn't have him very young, was older. So, yeah. you know, he doesn't have that family risk for profile. Yeah, so, yeah, I think we probably, probably needed not. to get him away from the heroin and the alcohol. Yeah. And he probably would have been okay. I'm not sure the advanced lipid profile would have helped him. How about Hank Williams? Uh, he, I think he died at age 29 or 30. Right. Now, we don't, he, would he die in the 50s? But um, would you get, a, get an advanced lipid profile on, on him? Or a- Again, you know, again, substance abuse, alcohol, and other drugs. Was that the inciting factor, or was it really a heart attack? I think it's blurry in the 50s. Mm-hmm. 
But if it was truly heart disease, you know, that he died of, yeah, he probably would have benefited from yeah. an LP Lilly in advance. Yeah, and he might have been tricky unless you knew a lot more about his um, you know, social history. But right. again, he's probably somebody that was more uh, pro, um, uh, more affected by alcohol and smoking and other right. things. Uh, Jackie Robinson is another one. He died um, in his 50s, early 50s, uh, uh, athlete, right. fit guy. Also, uh, clean living, as far as we know. Yeah, um, good community person. So he did all the right things, you know, yeah. for himself and the community. Mm -hmm. And I think he would have benefited. He probably did have either, you know, hyperlipidemia, high cholesterol, and or had an elevated LP little a. So he fit the risk profile of looking at an advanced lipid profile. Yeah, he could have had a familial hypercholesterolemia. Absolutely. We, you know, we didn't go into that specifically because that gets into genetic testing and, and cascade screening. And you, you'll what you'll learn from an advanced lipid profile is that you have a super high level of LDL, and you have to dig into that a little bit more to determine if you have a genetic reason for that, such as familial hypercholesterolemia. Right. But um, there's a very very good chance that people like Jackie Robinson, in fact, had that problem. Yeah, definitely. So so let's uh, let's say Jackie Robinson, for example. Let's say that uh, he. Um, I know, I know that you're a, a Yankees fan, so um, you know you probably were upset that Jackie Robinson played for the Dodgers. But you know, let's let's assume that you're 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 able to put that aside and, and were his treating <laughs> physician. And we we brought you back, uh, you know, to the 1950s. You got to meet him, and you happened to have the technology available, and you okay. got his lipid profile. And lo and behold, you found out he had super high cholesterol. He had small, dense LDL and lipoprotein LA. Right. So, and, you know, obviously we didn't have much tools then, but let's say you did everything you knew how. When would you check it again? Like, how would you use that to direct your therapy over the course of the, the next week, month, year? So, you know, you're not just looking at hidden risks when you're looking at advanced lipid profile on ApoB. You also can hit therapeutic targets that will affect those more than just LDL or triglycerides in and of itself. We know that small LDL or small dense LDL, which is kind of redundant, if it's small, it's dense, if it's dense, it's probably small, mm -hmm. is more atherogenic than you know, plain LDL. We know it tends to embed uh, in the arterial wall much more easily, oxidizes much more easily, and stays a lot longer in the vascular bed. Right. And so you pick that up from the advanced lipid profile. This what you'll find from advanced lipid profile. So. I think looking at it initially, and then if you're trying to hit a target, knowing how long it takes for that therapeutic regimen to work. So triglycerides really don't change you know, easily, especially by diet and exercise. You want to probably look at it again in nine months to a year. If you're using medications, most medications like statins will, in 30 days, you pretty much have goal, but you can't, by insurance standards, look at it a lipid profile if they want to pay well, for Jackie it. Well, Jackie Robinson sure. had money by that time, so let's see, so he's going to pay for it out of pocket. I would look Which, at it between a month and three months again okay. as lip, advanced lipid profile so you, and see if we were a therapeutic goal. So you would, if, if, if resources were not an issue, you would yeah. say, um, you put them on a statin and look at it again using an advanced lipid profile right. within six weeks to, to two months. Yep. Okay. And if, if once he's at goal, mm -hmm. then I can start pushing away from it, and then I can look at a standard lipid profile and then look at an advanced lipid profile maybe two times a year to make sure that oh, you would do he's it staying with. As many as two times a year. Yeah, once or twice a year thereafter. Uh, mm -hmm. Because people's habits, unless they have a roadmap, mm -hmm. will go back to what they used to do. Mm -hmm. And that's what I found in 30 years of medicine. Mm -hmm. I don't care how great the person is, most people go back to their standard habits. So if you're not monitoring them, telling them, look, you're on writing on the shoulder, mm. look, you're totally off road, mm. and you're, you know, your sugar's back up, and your lipid profile's really off, you, know, you need to get back on game again. You've kind of, you strayed too far. Okay. But yeah, that's what we do. We kind of pull so, them back into the road. So on this point, some advanced lipid profiles talk about the type of LDL, small dense versus large LDL. Right. And some of them talk about particle numbers. Yep. Uh, can you comment on one better than the other? Or do some some of the assays have both? How do you, how do you manage that? Some assays have both. Uh, I mean, there's I predominantly use two labs that I like, which I found have been very consistent on on how they report their stuff. But you know, small dense LDL is a, is not on an an NMR profile, which looks at LDL particles, VLDL, ILDL, so these smaller particles. And then HDL and, and LDL size. That's an NMR. And then on separate, you can order on top of that oxidized LDL, small dense LDL, 
you can measure and then inflammatory markers as well. And those are separate panels that you can individually mark off or do it. But you know, depending on what's off is what I'd look at. And if they're both off, then I'd look at both. So small, dense LDL and LDL particles are not exactly the same, but you may treat them similarly. Mm -hmm. Okay. And how do triglycerides fit into that equation um, when, you, when you're trying to think of how to manipulate this lipid profile most favorably? Yeah, so, you know, for a long time we've known that LDLs above 150 are atherogenic. That became semi-controversial for a while, and some, some physicians were saying, nah, only over 400 mm -hmm. is it atherogenic. And the data has been there for 150 for a long time. The newer data is actually pushing that maybe 100 or 125 is where we should be on people that are higher risk. So, again, lower, lower, lower. But people with high triglycerides on a standard lipid profile, usually LDL is inaccurate. And then that inaccuracy can be anywhere from 20 to 60%, depending on how high or high low their triglycerides are. Okay. So that's pretty inaccurate. You know, if you knew your pregnancy test was only accurate, you know, <laughs> in a small window, you probably wouldn't do it, yeah, right? No, so No argument there. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's the same concept. You know, this is a life or death issue. Yeah, so. now, now, some people would argue that most of what you can get from an advanced lipid profile, you can get from just a non-HDL cholesterol. How, how would you respond to that criticism? There's actually, there's plenty of data done on ApoB. And just to, to clarify, non-HDL means the total cholesterol minus the HDL. Right. The thinking is that only the HDL is good and all the other stuff is bad. So we'll just put all the other stuff in the same bucket and just deal with that. It gives you a good ballpark look when you're looking at non-HDL, but it's not quite as accurate as a... ApoB over A1 ratio, or looking at an advanced lipid profile, because then you're looking so just at to clarify, specifics. So we talked about ApoB in the first session being associated with the bad actors, and ApoA right. is associated with the good actors. Right. Yeah. So ApoA1 is pretty accurate on being you know the good guys, and ApoB is being five different atherogenic particles under one kind of oversight lab, mm -hmm. and that tends to be a little more accurate than non-HDL. And so I, I like that better, and I think it gives me better accuracy. But when you're talking about LDL particles and subparticle analysis, that's very different than a non-HDL. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that's quite good enough. And it's lard paintbrush versus fine paintbrush, you know, the difference of just the carpenter can make a bookshelf and the guy who carves, you know, beautiful scrolls into his, his mm -hmm. artwork. Okay. You know, very different. Both are woodworking, gotcha. but very different kinds gotcha. of woodworking. Fair enough. Good, good analogy. So how about different types of HDL. Is that ready for prime time? Is that just academic or oh, do you ever use that? That's a can of worms. So for a long time, you know, everybody says, well, I have a great HDL and you know, I'm safe. And mm -hmm. we've kind of found that that may not be really true. And we know that depends on whether your HDL is functional versus dysfunctional. So the analogy I use, do you have special ops guys or do you have Keystone Cops for HDL? <laughs> All right, um, I like that. And if you have a lot, there's actually some data showing that if your HDL is very high, it's probably non-functional, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of guys, but they're all bumping into themselves and not doing a whole lot of anything. Mm -hmm. So they're not really doing reverse cholesterol transport or taking bad cholesterol and pulling out of your system. Mm -hmm. They're not really decreasing thrombotic events, and they're not really decreasing inflammation. They're just there hanging out. And so there is one lab that does something called a functional HDL. Um, it has another name as well, and that's been correlated with coronary catheterizations. So it's a fairly accurate test. And it's looking at reverse cholesterol transport, which is how HDL works. It takes away bad cholesterol and gets it out into the liver to get rid of it. Yeah. yeah, to get rid of it. So we're still looking at better tests for that. Mm -hmm. And kind of the jury's out whether HDL is really accurate and is even a normal HDL really that good. So yeah, that's been kind of a storm. Well, we know we know epidemiologically that higher HDLs are associated with less heart disease and yes. low HDLs are not. Yeah. But the story isn't so clear compared to LDL. It's not. Right. It's not as clear, so clear. That's that's definitive. We know the lower you are, right. the better you and go. The famous example of that is the APO A1 Milano story where yes. the, the families in Italy had actually very low HDLs but didn't get atherosclerosis because they had right. super HDLs. That's a really interesting story. Yeah, that's but, a fun story. We should go into that story one well, day. Yeah, that'll, that'll be our HDL uh, podcast. Okay, that'll be fun. <laughs> but anyhow, all right, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap things up with the big question. Um, I'd call it the million-dollar question, but a million dollars isn't that big anymore. <laughs> but anyway, um, so we'll call it the billion-dollar question. Do you need cholesterol in your circulation at all? 
Of should, course. Yeah, you do. Well, before you, you jump in so fast, um, you know, some people argue that an LDL of zero is really the ultimate goal, and we really don't need any cholesterol. Cholesterol in the circulation is just the stuff our body's trying to get rid of because all of our cells can make cholesterol. So let me let me see what you have to say about that. Well, you, I'm going to be nitpicky. You said, do you need cholesterol? You need ah, cholesterol. Gotcha. But when you're it, measuring it, cholesterol. right, you're okay. measuring it on a blood test. Mm -hmm. It's the stuff that you're not utilizing to make hormones, to make you know normal, you know oils that you need for your skin and your hair, so you don't have straw for hair, etc. So, do you need circulating cholesterol? I think that's been controversial, and there is some data, and some people that argue that you do need a certain amount for normal brain function because you need cholesterol for brain function. For circulating cholesterol. Circul and, and then circulating but cholesterol. But your brain cells can make cholesterol. Yeah. I'm actually not un uncomfortable if we get down to single, high single digits or low, low double digits. I'm just not really sure the data is very clear when we get to single digit lower than nine or so. And then I get a little uncomfortable. And I, and I have colleagues that tell me, it doesn't really matter. You can bring it to zero and you're just fine. Mm -hmm. I'm okay with 20. I'm okay with 15. And but we get lower than that. Probably 2 versus 15 won't make that much of a yeah, difference. Yeah, and it's not an accurate test at that point either, is it? Well, um, again, if you do it directly, it could Direct it, could it is, yeah. yeah. But in the yeah. standard profile, it's probably not as, yeah. as, well, as but, accurate. And the reason I'm bringing, up, bringing it up is one of the arguments for using advanced lipid profiles is when we're looking at the very low numbers, you, you probably mm -hmm. need a, a direct measurement or advanced lipid profile yeah. help to really identify... Yeah the lowest possible risk. So let's say you get a patient that says, doc, just get my risk down to close to as zero as possible. You, you have my permission to do that. And then you would probably lean on your direct LDL measurements to, to be able to accomplish that. Well, we also know that if triglycerides are below 70, you have a 20% error rate on that calculated LDL. Mm -hmm. If it's above 150, it's a 20% error rate. It's above about 200, it's a 40% error rate. And even higher, it's like a 60% error rate. If you're on hormones, male or female hormones, females, people that are overweight, people that are insulin resistant, people with high triglycerides, all of those have an inaccurate LDL, calculated LDL number. And so there's so many variables on making the LDL, calculated LDL or LDLC inaccurate. I question on a recurrent basis, why are we even using it when it's not that expensive to do a direct LDL? So I'll do it on high risk patients. And if I have a question, I'll do it on someone that's non-fasting. But there's also the argument, how much fasting, you know, how long should they be fasting? Eight hours, 12 hours, are you really fasting? And then the, the second argument is, how long are you fasting during the day? It's only eight hours. So what is your cholesterol when you're not fasting? And if it's actually 250 after you've eaten, is that okay? Mm -hmm. sure. So I think LDL-C or LDL calculated LDL is very controversial at this point. Yeah, and certainly the whole concept of what happens for non-fasting samples is something we know right. very, very little about. Very little. Extraordinarily little about, because <laughs> everything we've done is based on fasting samples. Right. But I think the people are moving towards this idea that you know, LDLs as low as possible, even down to the single digits, is not a yeah. bad thing, because all of our cells can make cholesterol for their own cellular functions, and the stuff in the circulation is the extra stuff your body's yeah. trying to get rid of. Yeah. So that that's an argument. So it sounds like um, you're you're you, we're on the same page with regard to that. Yeah, I'm not worried when it's really low. In fact, you know, mine was normal when I had checked and I had actually uh, put on a blood pressure medicine. And my doc told me, you know, you really need to be on a stat. And I said, why? He goes, because you have hypertension and you're old. Ah. I said, Gee, thanks a lot, buddy. But <laughs> so you start you thinking do, you, you about got a new it, doctor. <laughs> yeah, but you start thinking about it. You know, the older you get, the higher chance you are of having heart disease. And that's is true. it a bad thought to really be on something that will prevent you from having something? Oh, so again, true. primary prevention. Is it aggressive? It's probably a little aggressive. Mm -hmm. But well, Al, thank you for this journey through advanced lipid profiles. It's been a fabulous conversation. Fine. I've learned a lot, as always, from my guests, and uh, hopefully the audience has learned something along the way as well. And with that, we conclude another session of MedEvidence. Thank you. Thanks for joining the MedEvidence podcast. To learn more, head over to medevidence.com or subscribe to our podcast on your favorite podcast platform.